Good morning or afternoon or evening, whenever you are tuning into this lecture. Uh, my name is Kirk Seide, and I'm one of the Dermatology Surgery Fellows here at Mayo. And I have the privilege of giving a short talk on skin cancer. So first, I, I don't have any disclosures to claim uh, or to make. Uh, and as we get started here, I just want to pause for a second. And, and just as an introduction, if you're able, take a quick look at your own skin. So the hands, forearms, if there's a mirror nearby, take a quick peek in, in the mirror and look at all the different spots and growths, uh, perhaps, and see if you can identify and pick out and give a name to any of the spots that you see, freckles or moles. If there are other things that you can't identify, uh, great. Hopefully we can spend a few minutes talking about that today. But uh, it's interesting how many different types of growths we have on the skin. Uh, and one of the reasons why dermatology residency is three years, because there's a lot to learn about the skin. Uh, so we'll get started here. I hope to accomplish or discuss these five major points today, uh, discussing the epidemiology and risk factors of skin cancer, reviewing the most common forms of skin cancer, and importantly, discussing the mimickers, things that look like skin cancer but aren't, and other common skin growths that you may come across. Briefly discuss the treatment options for skin cancer, and then outlining what steps can be taken to protect your skin from developing skin cancer. First, the epidemiology and risk factors of skin cancer. Skin cancer is by far the most common type of cancer in the United States. Uh, and some studies estimate that one in five or 20% of Americans will at some point in their life develop a skin cancer. And as we age, as we uh, get more birthdays under our belt, the risk of skin cancer increases along that continuum. Risk factors for skin cancer, I don't think any of these will be a surprise light colored skin, skin that burns easily or freckles, blonde or red hair, blue or green eyes. So you can think of my skin or redhead as the classic high risk for developing skin cancer. So those are more of the genetic things that we can't necessarily control, but put us at an increased risk of skin cancer. There are also environmental things that can increase our risk. So a history of sunburns and particularly blistering sunburns, use of indoor tanning devices, organ transplant recipients, if you've had a skin cancer or if someone in your family's had a skin cancer, particularly a first degree relative, that increases your risk and also any form of immunosuppression. So other medical conditions or medications that you may take that suppress your immune system, all of these things can increase our risk of skin cancer. All right, section two here, the most common forms of skin cancer. Basal cell carcinoma is by far the most common type of skin cancer. Squamous cell carcinoma is the second most common type, and melanoma, which is the one that most of us are familiar with or probably have heard the most about, and is historically thought of as the deadliest form of skin cancer, though we'll chat a little bit later about um, if that's true or not, but these are the three most common types of skin cancer um, that we'll discuss today. So again, basal cell carcinoma, most common type of skin cancer a lot of variability in how these appear on the skin. So it can be a shiny dome-shaped growth, like the upper right here. Let's see if I can get my pointer to work, upper right here. More of a pinkish, ill-defined patch, like in the lower left. Or it could just be a sore that doesn't completely heal or go away or something that bleeds spontaneously and just won't seem to go back to normal skin. Uh, and the sneaky form of basal cell carcinoma is this scar-like or what we call a morpheiform basal cell carcinoma. You can see it looks more atrophic or more like there's a depression in the skin, uh, but this too can be a, a subtype of basal cell carcinoma. This typically occurs in sun-exposed skin, scalp, face, neck, and hands, though it can occur elsewhere on the body, other places that don't see much sun. Uh, and fortunately, since it's the most common type of skin cancer, fortunately, it almost never spreads to other parts of the body or almost never metastasizes. However, if it's not treated, it just continues to grow where it is. It gets wider, it gets deeper, and it can invade into tissue and bone if it's not treated. So it can cause quite a bit of morbidity uh, and illness if it's not adequately and appropriately treated. Squamous cell carcinoma also has a variable appearance. This can pop up as a crusted or rough bump. It can be a red, rough, flat patch, similar to the photo we saw previously. It can be more of a dome-shaped bump, or again, a sore that doesn't heal. 
So you can see how different all of these pictures look, more of a, an eroded red bump that looks maybe like it's blood on a few occasions, more of a yellow or skin colored uh, scaly patch on the hand, and then kind of an ill-defined, doesn't look too concerning red pink bump on the lip. And all of these are squamous cell carcinoma. These two most commonly occur on sun exposed skin, same areas, but also can occur anywhere and can be mediated by the HPV virus or the wart virus. Uh, and so for this reason, you can see it in the genitalia or even can develop inside the mouth as well. And squamous cell carcinoma, while typically very treatable, uh, can spread to other parts of the body if it's not treated, it can metastasize. So unlike basal cell carcinoma, which almost never does that, squamous cell carcinoma can do that. Um, and in fact, almost, depending on what study you look at, almost if not more patients die from squamous cell carcinoma uh, as, as they do melanoma. So melanoma is historically thought of as the deadliest form of skin cancer, but squamous cell carcinoma can unfortunately also be deadly if not caught early and treated appropriately. So actinic keratosis or the singular actinic keratosis is a, not a full true blown, um, full blown skin cancer. It's more of what we call a precancer, a precancerous growth that if, if not treated can turn into a squamous cell carcinoma. And again, depending on what study you look at, um, estimates vary for how quickly or how often that happens. I usually tell my patients between one in a hundred to one in a thousand actinic keratoses will go on to turn into a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, that's for any individual given lesion. But if you have a lot of them, like in this top picture here, uh, that probability adds up. As you have more of those precancers, there's a higher chance that one of them would go on to turn into a squamous cell carcinoma. Uh, these typically appear as dry, scaly, rough textured spots on the skin. Oftentimes we can feel these even better than we can see them. So when I do a skin exam, I'm usually feeling on, uh, on sun exposed skin, particularly on the face. If there's any red tinge or subtle pink, I'll feel to see if it's rough and gritty. And if so, typically we treat these with liquid nitrogen or cryotherapy, just a cold blast of spray that destroys that top layer of skin and hopefully would then go back to being normal skin underneath. Uh, and again, these typically form on skin that receives a lot of sun exposure. Moving on to melanoma, uh, again, thought of as the deadliest form of skin cancer, uh, but again, squamous cell carcinoma can also be very dangerous. Melanoma can develop on normal skin. In, in the majority of cases, it does develop on, on completely normal skin, what we call a de novo development of melanoma, but it can also develop from an existing mole. Uh, we think about 30% of melanomas arise within an existing mole. Uh, new rapidly growing moles or what look like moles or any moles that change in shape, color, or size can be a sign of melanoma. So if you notice any brown spots that are changing rapidly or we'll go over the ABCD uh, E's here in a second, anything that's changing a lot is probably worth having someone take a look at. Melanoma can develop almost anywhere under fingernails, under toenails, between toes, bottoms of the feet, uh, so that the risk does go up with sun exposure or in areas that have seen a lot of sun, but these can develop in areas that almost never see the sun. And in skin of color, melanoma often appears on the palms, soles, under the nails, in the mouth, or in the genitals. So again, can it appear anywhere and in, in patients who have skin of color, um, more common to appear in these more atypical locations. So the ABCDEs of melanoma is just a memory tool to know what types of features and characteristics to keep an eye out for, uh, uh, for red flags or warning signs that maybe this spot is a melanoma. So the A is asymmetry. If one half of the lesion or the, the spot or the bump looks different from the other half. B is for border, an irregular or scalloped or a poorly defined border. C is for color. Uh, any spot or bump that has multiple different types of colors, that's a little bit concerning. D is for diameter, so greater, greater than six millimeters or about the size of a pencil eraser. And then E is for evolving or changing. And as these features add up, we get more concerned about the risk of melanoma. So here's just an example of a melanoma that meets a lot of those criteria. So it's asymmetric, it has an irregular border, multiple different colors. There's a brown, black, pink, purple. 
a large diameter, tough to tell, but likely greater than six millimeters. And then again, tough to know if it's evolving or changing. Uh, and so it's important to be aware of the moles that you have on your body so that you can watch for those changes. All right, so those are the three most common types of skin cancer, basal cell carcinoma, squamous cell carcinoma, and melanoma. And now we're gonna spend a few minutes talking about the mimickers or other common skin growths that you may notice and be worried, is this a skin cancer or not? First is lentigines. Uh, age spots is how they're sometimes referred to, but in dermatology, we try not to use that language. We'll say wisdom spot or wisdom bump. Oh, we had an announcement here. committed to creating a safe environment for our patients and staff. To ensure everyone's safety, we require that patients, visitors, and staff wear a face mask that properly covers both your nose and mouth while on Mayo Clinic's campus. Thank you for your help. So these lentigines or wisdom spots typically present as flat brown spots on areas that see a lot of sun, particularly on the tops of the hands or on the face. These are completely harmless, um, but they can mimic melanoma. So if I saw a patient like this in the lower left-hand corner, you know, I'd be taking a close look at all these brown spots to look for any other features of, of melanoma um, because there is a form of melanoma that can look very similar to these lentigines. Next are seborrheic keratoses. This is probably the most common skin growth that dermatologists see on a, on a daily basis. We look at hundreds of these a day. These appear as rough bumps that often have a waxy or a stuck on appearance, almost like you could just scrape them off. Sometimes patients do, and sometimes they come back after that. Um, they can be different colors, often brown, but can be skin colored, pink, white, dark black. Um, so they can look different on different individuals and even on different parts of the body can look different. Uh, these form on any parts of the skin except for the palms and soles. And if they're irritated, if they're painful or itchy, if they get caught on clothing, if they bleed, um, they can be removed. And typically how we remove these is a cold, that cold liquid nitrogen spray or the cryotherapy, or sometimes we'll apply some heat or scrape them off. Um, but if they're irritated, they, they can be removed. Sebaceous hyperplasia, um, this is the result of an enlarged or a clogged oil gland. So you can see this picture here on the left, the skin color to yellow pink bump. So small yellow or white, um, sometimes have a little bit of an indentation in the center, which you can kind of make out here. Uh, and importantly, these can mimic basal cell carcinoma. Um, even for dermatologists, it can be tricky to tell apart a sebaceous hyperplasia bump or an oil gland from a basal cell carcinoma. So sometimes we'll just watch these really closely. If we notice something that may be a skin cancer, maybe a sebaceous hyperplasia, if we're leaning more towards an oil gland, we'll just keep a close eye on it. Um, but oftentimes we need to take a sample or a biopsy to tell definitively which one of those it is. Cherry angioma is also very common, uh, usually not as concerning to patients because they, they don't have the appearance that mimics skin cancer, but very, very common. These are small bright red or purple growths um, composed of small blood vessels under the skin. So that's what gives them their red color. Often on the upper body, but can be almost anywhere. And these two can be removed if, if bothersome since it's a collection of blood vessels. Sometimes they bleed easily or it's tough to get them to stop bleeding if they get bumped. Um, so these can also be treated if necessary. Moles. Um, moles appear typically in sun, uh, sun exposed skin, but again, can occur anywhere usually develop in the first 20, 30 years of life. Uh, and typically new moles do not appear in adults. Most moles are har harmless. And if you can remember those A, B, C, D, E's of melanoma, that can help distinguish a normal, healthy, benign, harmless mole from a melanoma. And these can have a, a varied appearance as well from a pink skin colored bump uh, of a dermal nevus or a dermal mole that's a little bit deeper in the skin to the more classic brown, slightly raised bump or spot on the skin. Milia, also very common, small white bumps about the size of a pinhead, often on the eyelids or cheeks. And these are basically small, tiny cysts under the skin. So they're caused by flakes of skin that get trapped underneath the skin surface. And then they build up that small cyst of, that, of the skin cells instead of sloughing off like they normally would, they fill up in that little ball underneath the skin and form these tiny little cysts. And again, these can be removed, usually 
If we want to remove them, we'll just nick them and then pop them out. Uh, pretty simple and straightforward to do. Okay, so that was a, a brief review of some of the common mimickers or other common skin growths on the skin. Now we'll turn back to skin cancer and discuss what treatment options are available. When caught early, skin cancer is very treatable. Uh, and when we consider what treatment is most appropriate for a patient, we think about the type of skin cancer it is. Is it a basal cell, squamous cell, melanoma, something else? What subtype of those skin cancers as well? How big is it? How deep do we think it goes? Where is it on the body? How we treat a skin cancer on the nose is different than how we treat it on the back. And we also consider the underlying health of the patient and any other comorbidities or other health conditions. Uh, uh, we also think about those when we come up with a treatment plan. In general, the treatment options for skin cancer, we can break into topical therapies, destruction or destructive methods, excision, or Mohs surgery. And we'll spend a little bit of time talking about all of these. Topical therapy, um, one example would be a chemotherapy cream. Um, in particular, the one we use most often, there are other options, but most often we use this cream called Effudex is the brand name, or 5-fluorouracil, um, which is a cream that's applied twice daily to the skin for typically about three weeks or 21 days. Uh, and this is, again, applied to the areas of the skin where we need to treat the precancerous or sometimes the superficial skin cancer, and that helps to destroy the cancer or the precancerous cells. And when we use it, the expected response is that the skin will get very red and inflamed, irritated, sometimes a bit, un often a bit uncomfortable. Uh, and that's what we want and expect. Uh, so we always try to be very clear when, when patients use this to expect this very vigorous and sometimes uncomfortable response. Uh, and that's typically a sign that the medication is doing what we want it to do. Sometimes we have a, a bit too strong of a response. Um, for the patient's given skin type, and we'll have to use other creams or ointments to soothe that inflammation. Um, but this is just something where you want to be in close contact with your dermatologist about uh, what's appropriate, how strong is too strong of a response, if it becomes too irritating, what can be done, uh, because there are op options and every patient varies a bit. All right, destructive methods. Uh, so the terminology you'll hear is electrodesiccation and curatage, or uh, curatage and cryotherapy. So that common part of the name there, the curatage is what's depicted in this picture here. That's basically taking this instrument, a curette, and after the skin has been anesthetized or numbed, we take that curette and we basically scrape away the skin cancer. And then we either apply heat, that's the electrodesiccation, or a cold spray, the cryotherapy. And we do that for a couple of rounds usually takes about 10 to 20 minutes for a visit to get this treatment accomplished. So again, it's numbing, scraping, and then burning or freezing. And for many types of skin cancer, this is a very appropriate and effective treatment, often higher than a 90 or 95% cure rate, as long as you're using it on the right type of skin cancer and in the right location. So that's typically what we would do it for a destructive method of skin cancer. Excision is cutting out the skin cancer or the tumor along with the margin of surrounding normal skin. So you can see that depicted here. So this would be an example of a, a biopsy had been done. We know that this is a skin cancer. And so the patient comes back in for an excision and we measure a little bit of normal skin around the outside. That's what we call the margin. And that varies, the distance varies based on what type of skin cancer. Uh, and then if we just tried to cut out that circle and tried to close it back up with stitches, the ends would pucker up like a canoe. Uh, and so we add these little triangles on either side, here and here, turn it into more of a football shape. And then we remove all this skin. And once that skin's out, then we put stitches in underneath the skin to bring the skin edges back together. And it closes up in a nice straight flat line. And that scar actually looks better than if we just tried to cut out that circle and then stitch it back together. And then after that skin is cut out, it's sent to the dermatopathologist or the doctor who looks at it under the microscope uh, just to make sure those edges look clear. So that's an excision. And that is different from the last procedure we'll discuss, which is Mohs micrographic surgery. 
Uh, and this is one of the most successful surgical treatments for removing skin cancer. I may be a little bit biased because this is, uh, this is what I'm doing in my fellowship is learning this surgical technique. Um, but many studies have shown that this is a very successful way to treat skin cancer. Uh, the procedure typically requires two to five hours on average, sometimes more, quick, more uh, quickly than that, sometimes longer than that. Sometimes patients end up spending their whole day with us. So um, if a patient does have Mohs surgery, we counsel them to expect to be with us all day, and hopefully they're out before that. But on average, it's usually about two to five hours. And with this surgical technique, both the peripheral, meaning the outside, and the deep margin or edge uh, is assessed to see if any skin cancer is left. And that's what makes it a successful skin cancer treatment. And then after the skin cancer is removed, part two is the reconstruction, where we come up with a plan to bring the skin edges back together or to heal that hole that we just created by removing the skin cancer. We don't go in, into the details of, of that process, but sometimes we let that hole heal in on its own over time, and it will. It heals from the bottom up and the sides in. Sometimes we're able to just stitch the edges together side, side to side, just like the picture we discussed in the last slide. And if the, if the hole is bigger, deeper in a cosmetically sensitive area uh, or near a margin on the nose or the lip or the eye, sometimes we have to be a bit more creative and do a bit more stitching and use things like flaps or graphs to get that to close up. But um, that's what we do all day, every day. So uh, very often ends up in a very good cosmetic outcome, no matter which treatment approach we take. So this process, Mohs surgery, uh, kind of a busy picture here, but I just wanted to briefly discuss what the process is. So again, after the skin has been numbed with an with an local anesthesia, a disc or a layer of skin is removed right where the biopsy was or where the skin cancer appears to be. And then that skin is taken and processed and looked at under the microscope as the patient waits. And that process usually takes about one to two hours, uh, the removal, the processing, and the looking under the microscope. And then when we look at it under the microscope, if there's any skin cancer left uh, at the, again, the peripheral or the outside edge or the deep edge, we're able to pinpoint exactly where that skin cancer is left and go back and take more skin, process it, look at it under the microscope and repeat that process until all the skin cancer is gone. So that provides a very high cure rate, making sure we get all of those cancerous cells removed from the body. Often 95, 98, 99% cure rates for many types of skin cancer. So that's Mohs micrographic surgery. Uh, and lastly here, what steps can be taken to protect your skin from skin cancer? So first, protecting your skin from UV light is probably the most important thing you can do. So some tips for doing this effectively, seeking shade, especially between 10 a.m. and 2 p.m. where the, ray, the sun's rays are the strongest, wearing lightweight, long sleeve clothing, wide brimmed hat and sunglasses are additional ways to protect your skin your skin from the sun. Um, and then of course, applying sunscreen. So the counseling we give on sunscreen is making sure it's broad spectrum. That means it covers both UVA and UVB sunlight. And it should say that on the label, SPF 30 or higher. And then if you're gonna be sweating a lot or swimming, uh, a water resistant sunscreen is a good idea as well. There's no true um, completely waterproof sunscreens, but there are water resistant sunscreens. And then importantly, reapplying every couple of hours is a good idea because the efficacy of the sunscreen tends to fade around that time. Every 90 to 120 minutes, you wanna put on another layer of sunscreen. Uh, and avoid tanning. Any tanning is basically a sign of sun damage. Uh, some patients ask about getting vitamin D from the sun. Uh, that's a valid point in question, but it really does not take very much sunlight at all to get the vitamin D that you need. Just a few minutes really out in the sun on your arms gives you enough sunlight to make that vitamin D. And there are, there are other ways to get the vitamin D that you need as well. Eating a healthy balanced diet, taking a multivitamin or supplement of vitamin D are other ways that you can get vitamin D without being out in the sun and increasing your risk of skin cancer. We also recommend performing monthly self skin exams. So just like I mentioned at the top of this lecture here, just once a month, uh, when you're looking in the mirror, try to take a brief assessment of all the spots that you have. Look at your hands and forearms, look in the mirror, 
when you're in the shower, look at the rest of your body and just become familiar with all the bumps and the growths and the spots that you have. And our brains are very good at becoming familiar and being able to pick up on change changes. So you may not be able to give them names, but your brain will be able to say, oh, this spot has changed since the last time I looked at it, which may be a sign that you need to make an appointment with your dermatologist. So doing that month, once a month is a good idea, and it can be tricky to see all parts of your skin. So there's a few pictures here on trying to do your best to look at your back, the bottoms of your feet. Again, skin cancer can occur almost anywhere. So taking a good full assessment of your skin once a month uh, will help prevent or catch skin cancer early. Keeping all appointments with your dermatologist. Once a patient has had one skin cancer, your risk of developing a second or more skin cancer goes way up. Um, and so usually if, we, if a patient has had a skin cancer, we say you should be seen by a dermatologist or someone who's comfortable looking at your skin head to toe at least once a year, sometimes more, but at least once a year, just to monitor for either recurrence of the skin cancer you had previously and to see if you develop new skin cancers elsewhere. And again, scheduling an appointment if you notice anything changing, itching, bleeding, anything that just seems to look a lot different than, the, than your other spots, um, spots on your skin, um, always a good idea to have someone take a look at that and make sure it's not an early skin cancer. All right, so we covered a lot of ground here. We discussed the epidemiology and risk factors of skin cancer. Uh, we reviewed the most common forms of skin cancer. Again, basal cell, squamous cell, and melanoma. We discussed some of the important mimickers and other common skin growths. We described the treatment options for skin cancer, that being topical therapies like the creams, destructive methods, a scrape and burn and scrape or scrape and freeze, excision where, remo where we are removing skin with a scalpel, and the Mohs micrographic surgery where we're removing the skin and then looking at a, under the microscope that same day. Uh, and then again, lastly, we discussed steps that can be taken to protect your skin uh, from the sun, from the other risk factors for developing skin cancer. Um, and with that, I'll just put up my references here. Most of the, the images and the, the language and counseling that I used today was taken from the American Academy of Dermatology Patient Education Handout. So if you come to dermatology for a clinic visit, we have lots of great handouts from the American Academy of Dermatology. They have a great website as well. So I'd highly recommend that uh, if you want to learn more about these types of skin cancer or steps that can be taken to avoid skin cancer. Uh, a few images from our dermatology textbook by Bologna and colleagues, and then most of the images came from a website called Visual DX, uh, which again is a great resource for lots of different types of skin conditions. And if after this talk you've noticed something on your skin, you're concerned about something, um, our Mayo Clinic Dermatology Appointment Office is listed here, 507-284-2536. We have a great team of, of dermatologists and um, physician assistants and other advanced practice providers who are happy to take a look at your skin anytime, provide counseling and, and any treatment that's necessary. So with that, uh, thank you again for the opportunity to give this brief presentation on skin cancer. Again, my name is Kirk Seide. I'm happy to answer any questions uh, if, if able, or if you would like to make an appointment, again, the number is listed here. Thanks and have a great day.